Fair, my loyal nine patriots. Welcome to the Communist Hit List series. In the previous series, we covered how General Patton and Secretary James Forstall were killed by communists. If you missed those, check out the link I have for you below. And if you have time, pick up some Invader coffee and stick it to Starbucks. Discount code below. So let's get started. To kick this off right, a quick background on Joseph McCarthy is probably appropriate, considering everything that he did during the McCarthyism era, the choices he made were based on his past experiences. He was born in 1908 into a poor Irish Catholic family in Wisconsin, later earned a bachelor's degree and became a judge. Then in 1942, he became a Marine, even though he was exempt from military service because he was a judge. Then he later on went to serve in the Pacific as an intelligence officer until the end of the war. After World War II, though, in 1946, McCarthy was elected as senator of Wisconsin. At this point, this is where the information, manipulation, and what I like to call a hodgepodge of vomit and mud start to come into play, meaning it's just this nauseating regurgitation after regurgitation of lies and misinformation. If we try to just conduct basic research on McCarthy, many online resources like Wikipedia immediately begin this passive aggressive style of attacks or dog whistle style of attacks. For example, they downplay his military career as undistinguished, where they sprinkle these little buzzwords in that frame how you're supposed to view McCarthy and his communist infiltration claims by using words like reckless, demagogic, unsubstantiated claims, shotgun blast, all these styles. It's misleading and it's dishonest, not only to McCarthy and everything that that man stood for, but to the reader who just wants a basic understanding of the situation. So what's the net effect of all that? It all compounds and makes it worse and worse as time goes on. So let's dive into the truth right now and set the record straight, not only for McCarthy, but for the American people. If we think that the media today is different than it was 50, 60, 70 years ago, you were completely mistaken. And I, for one, thought the media was different, but they are not. In 1950, in Wheeling, West Virginia, McCarthy gives his Enemies from Within speech, where he first brought his communist charges that communism had infiltrated our government. He is met with extreme resistance from members of our government and the media. Most Americans were surprised by these charges, which prompted the Tidings Committee. With Democrat Senator Milliard Tidings being chairman and the makeup of the committee consisting of three Democrats and two Republicans. Oh, and by the way, a fun fact about Miller Tidings, his father-in-law was Joseph E. Davis, who was known to be very friendly with communists. But to get directly to the point, the Tidings Committee was worthless. With Tidings claiming to give McCarthy the, quote, the complete investigative powers the Republic has ever seen, unquote, which was a lie, Tidings was not allowing Republicans, including McCarthy, to attend executive hearings or closed session hearings. These hearings are private and the media is not allowed in, nor is anyone involved in the hearings allowed to disclose what happened in the hearing. The Tidings Committee also gave the accused a clean bill of health and whitewashed all the information. One individual in a temporary clerical position for the Department of State was ordered, along with eight others, to remove all derogatory information in Department of State employees' files. He recalls that that material that was removed involved questionable morals that reflected on their loyalty, and he remembers one person's file was completely whitewashed, all the bad material in it was removed because it dealt with them being part of a subversive organization. So why was Tidings holding these backroom hearings? Why was he concealing the truth? Was he attacking witnesses? Because if you are at all familiar with this era, McCarthy requested numerous times for the executive hearings and for no party, no Democrat or Republican to be excluded. But we'll dive into that more shortly. But how was the media covering the hearings from McCarthy? Well, as you may have guessed from my intro of this section, the majority of the media, and I say majority because at the time there was still some good media out there, 
that hadn't been completely co-opted by communists, but the majority of the media was covering for the Democrats and the communists that McCarthy had exposed. Of course, they attacked McCarthy through every avenue, taxes, digging up old rumors, fabricating lies, and even his military record. They referred to McCarthy as a fascist and even used the term anti-fascist to describe themselves. Now let that sink in. But let's look at one of the most vocal media personalities at the time, Drew Pearson. Pearson was a columnist, radio show host, a communist sympathizer who spread messages of pure hate and lies about not only McCarthy, but about Secretary James Forstall, which we covered in episode two. These lies, however, were eventually exposed, but did it really matter at the time? No. The damage was done and the minds were shaped to hate McCarthy and the people alike. Pearson himself employed members of the Communist Party, including Andrew Alder and David Carr. Alder covered the un-American activities and Carr was formerly employed by the communist media arm known as the Daily Worker. Additionally, the communist left and the media went after McCarthy's tax returns too. Doesn't that sound familiar? Because they could not find anything wrong with him. The Truman administration weaponized the IRB, which is the Internal Revenue Bureau, now the IRS, to strong arm an employee to alter tax records and fabricate details. Now, ultimately, McCarthy did win that legal battle. However, he was still out of the money that he had to use to pay for his defense, while the IRB had tax-funded lawyers. Which leads us into the tactics the communist left was using to destroy McCarthy and others alike. Lenin once said, We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, scorn, and the like towards those who disagree with us. Hence why we saw Drew Pearson and others in the media lie, twist the truth, and personally attack people who disagreed with the communist agenda. You have to consider the second and third order effects of these attacks. They did not just affect McCarthy, but everyone. It deterred other members of government from speaking out if they knew of communist activity. It made people fear siding with McCarthy, which ultimately led to more communist infiltration. So what was the overall effect? It conditioned people not to stand up for what they believe in. It is the same tactic we see in modern times. For example, you're Islamophobic, you're transphobic, you're homophobic, if you don't completely agree with them, if you're not in complete lockstep. There is an old adage about McCarthy, and it goes, I agree with Senator McCarthy, I just don't agree with his methods. And I'll have to admit, I have said this, and I am ashamed I ever did, because McCarthy had no choice. McCarthy went to President Truman, he went before the Tidings Committee, but instead of taking the allegations seriously, the Democrats and the media accused McCarthy of attempting to oust political opponents and put a stain on the Truman presidency. But this was further from the truth. Multiple times McCarthy asked for executive hearings, those private hearings we discussed earlier. But the Tidings Committee and the Democrats time and time again prevented it from happening. To dive into the point a little bit further, if you examine the public hearings, numerous times Democrats would consistently interrupt McCarthy while he was speaking and demand to know the names of the accused. McCarthy, like clockwork, would either decline to publicly name them or he would request an executive hearing. Of course, the Democrats in the media would claim he was lying and didn't have any names. This is where history has failed everyone. They leave out the potential legal consequences if he were to name them. McCarthy stated that some of the people on his list probably were not communists, and publicly stating those names would open him up for libel suits and defamation. Remember guys, McCarthy used to be a judge in Wisconsin, and a pro-communist media personality like Drew Pearson sued him in 1951. So why would he open himself up to more lawsuits? Lawsuits, whether warranted or not, was a common tactic put out by the communists. The idea was that if you were accused of being a communist, you would sue the accuser. See guys, it didn't matter whether you won or lost the case. What mattered was you were causing the other person to lose money. And there's countless cases of this happening. Again, all this was, was to condition the population not to accuse people, even if warranted. 
McCarthy wasn't the only one trying to avoid lawsuits, so were other media personalities. When McCarthy was on a television program, he offered to name 29 people, but the host promptly told him not to do it. They never openly said why, but it's clear they were trying to avoid a lawsuit. But McCarthy wanted the news stations to become involved if lawsuits were to happen. McCarthy living on just a senator's salary doesn't have the same legal capabilities as a media organization. Unfortunately, though, the tactics used by the communists, they ultimately worked. And on December 2nd, 1954, McCarthy was censored by the Senate, even though that same year he was voted the fourth most admired man in America. But that censor destroyed any chance America had at removing communists in our government and society. Even worse, McCarthy was not vindicated until after his death. Now let's talk about McCarthy's vindications. They're almost endless, however, I will just touch on just a few to really drive the point home. As I previously stated in episode 2 about James Forrestal, the Venona projects are a gold mine of information and really show how bad the infiltration was. We never even decrypted everything. Imagine what lies in those messages, those files. The second thing is the McCarran Committee, which was a committee investigating internal security, uncovered over 200,000 files that detailed communist activity. They were stashed away in a barn. The third thing is the fall of the Soviet Union allowed access into the archives from Soviet satellite states. And this information covers a multitude of communist activity in the United States government, including Communist International, CPUSA, the Daily Worker, and their marching orders within the United States, how that information was obtained and disseminated, including what that information was. And this one's kind of crazy. Even secret meetings that took place between American politicians, including George Bush and Soviet leaders. Fourth thing, and the last thing that I'm going to cover, we have information obtained from a Freedom of Information Act from a former secret counterintelligence archive of the FBI, which was closely tracking communist and pro-communist activities. While it is heavily censored and information is redacted, it again proves McCarthy was right. But if we move on to McCarthy's death, April 27th, 1957, he went to Bethesda Hospital, which this is kind of a common hospital for deaths on anti-communist people. He went to Bethesda for an old knee injury he sustained during his military service. Then he suddenly dies May 2nd, just a few days after admission, with the cause of death being hepatitis, acute cause unknown. Well, if you don't know the cause of death, do an autopsy. But when you murder someone, it's usually not a good idea to conduct an autopsy because then multiple autopsies will follow the first. There are theories out there about how McCarthy could have been murdered. Some say carbon tetrachloride, which is plausible considering how widely used and available it was back then. It's in fire suppressant materials, all sorts of stuff. Either way, after his censor by the Senate, McCarthy died. And maybe it was carbon tetrachloride or maybe it was his liver. The fact is McCarthy died and maybe it was murder or maybe he was driven to self-mutilation. I'm not here to spread misinformation. I'm here to tell you the truth as I know it and as I have researched it. That communists, whoever they may have been, if they wanted to murder McCarthy, they could have done it. And they could have done it especially without there being an autopsy, which will never know the cause of death. I'm going to leave you with this. It's a quote from McCarthy. It does little good to argue about changing our suicidal foreign policy so long as the men in charge of forming that policy were in the camp of the enemy. Loyal 9 out.